We get to continue in the book of Romans and in our current sermon series, which is More Than Conquerors, Finding Hope in the Gospel. Now, in the first few weeks of this series, we've talked about the fact that more than conquerors, being more than a conqueror means that our victory is so decisive and complete in Jesus Christ that we can't even lose. And not only that, we get to enjoy the rewards for winning a fight that we did not even have to fight. It's pretty awesome to be more than a conqueror, but here's the big question that I wanna ask you all this morning. How many of you feel like more than a conqueror? I knew that was gonna get that kind of a response. We know the truth of it in our heads, but I feel like sometimes in our hearts, we're just begging God to allow that to become a reality because we live in a world that is broken and we live in a world that is full of sin. And we live in a world that is designed to steal, kill, and destroy. But that should not rob us of the reality of who and what we are in Christ, which is more than conquerors. And I'm glad that you all are here this morning. And I am so thankful for God's word because Romans chapter 6 reveals a secret to successfully living as more than a conqueror. So how many of you are interested already in where we're going? I, I, like, I like things that catch me by surprise. And, and uh, that's what this passage did. This passage, it's not necessarily new truth, but the reality of how important this truth is to our walk with Christ is something that is phenomenal, something that we all need to know. And so the title of the message this morning is this, know who you are. Know who you are. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the placebo effect? Anybody ever heard of the placebo effect? Okay, the placebo effect is when a person's mental or physical health appears to improve after taking a dummy treatment. So what happens is you go to a doctor or healthcare provider and they give you a fake drug, they give you something that's not real and they tell you that it's gonna take care of the problem that you have and guess what? You believe Obviously, um, it, it's obviously not the treatment that heals you, but it's your belief in the treatment. And because you believe that you're getting better because of whatever it is you're taking, somehow you begin to start getting better. There's a lot of experiments that go with this. And the whole point of where I'm trying to go is that our minds have so much power. Your mindset truly can change everything. I'm thankful for the month of November. I'm thankful for those of you that started on November 1, taking one day out of the year, one day each month to say something that you're thankful for. That is a wonderful mindset. Your mind has power. Our mind has more power than we realize. Most of our experiences, they begin with a thought. That thought then creates a ripple effect that spreads throughout our life. And the more you think on what you want, your mind shifts and automatically pulls you in that direction. I have a personal illustration that will help bring this all home. It has to do with the love that Alana and I share. And it starts a little over 20 years ago, a little tw over 20 years ago on this very property right here. I was just a college student with so much to learn. And I was teaching our singles class up here in a room over here in this corner. And while I was teaching, this beautiful lady here had this thought go through her mind. And she's like, you know what? That's not too bad. And if I'm gonna be married to someone in the ministry, I don't wanna be bored the rest of my life. And so all of a sudden that morning, this is not by my own testimony, this is by her words, okay, what she would say. By her own example that morning, all of a sudden, she started looking at Mike Brown a little bit differently. Before that day, I was just Mike Brown. After that day, I was hmm, Mike Brown. Interesting. <laughs> so once that began to happen, she couldn't take her thoughts away from Mike Brown. This is a true story. I'm not embellishing anything this morning. So she could not stop thinking about it. And because she was thinking about it, all of a sudden, all of her actions just pulled her in that direction. And lo and behold, fast forward a long time later, it just so happened to be Christmas. And I live in Pennsylvania, in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, but somehow Alana and her mom and dad ended up at my mom and dad's church that you have to go to on purpose in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Because they just happened to be driving by. Okay, we had known each other for a while and they were within about an hour and a half. So they did decide to come over to church and they did hang out for that weekend. And she hung out at our house with our family and we stayed up late playing games and it was a lot of fun. And the next day when we left, she got in her vehicle and she said, I'm going to marry that man. <laughs> and to make a really long story short, here we are today. 
And what I realized as I was studying about the power of the mind, I think I was a victim. I didn't even know what happened to me. I was just an innocent bystander. And she started pulling me in that direction. No, thank God I did. We both opened our eyes. And man, I could not say anything greater about the love that God has given us. And we're about to celebrate 20 years of marriage this year in June. And I thank God for my, would you give her a big round of applause? She's a wonderful (laughs) wife. And a good sport. And really, I didn't even embellish that story that much. She did like me first. I have to just leave that there. So anyway, no. Moving on from that, what are we talking about this morning? (laughs) Your thoughts affect all aspects of your life. God wants us to think deeply about who and what we are in him. The whole book of Romans up to this point, the book of Romans, a lot of people stay away from it because there's a lot of doctrine. There's a lot of just teaching and practical things. But the whole point of everything that we've been learning is so that we would think deeply about who we are. He starts with three chapters on the fact that we are condemned. We are sinners. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. We are all guilty before a righteous God. But then Jesus Christ, he loved us enough to go to a cross. He died and he rose again. And by faith, by putting our faith in his death and in his resurrection, we can be made right with God. Then we get to chapter five, and man, because of that justification, we are blessed. We sung that song again this morning. On my best days, I'm a child of God. On my worst days, I'm a child of God. Oh, every day is a good day, and you're the reason why. Man, we are blessed, and we we can be confident Because just like we are confident that we are sinners because we are born in Adam, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, when we are born again, we can be more certain that the righteousness of Jesus Christ is passed to us and every single day truly is a good day because we're blessed. That's just a real quick recap, as brief as I could, of everything that we've gone through so far in the book of Romans that leads us up here to chapter 6. Now look at what it says at the very beginning of verse 1. Based on everything in the first five chapters, what shall we say then? Basically, Paul's saying, now what? What do we do with our what do we do with all of this? We're not sinners, we're declared righteous, we're blessed. What do we do with all of this? I know. He's gonna give us a list of rules to follow, right? Nope. Oh, I know he's gonna give us a list of really good deeds that we can go out and do in this world. Nope, that's not what's coming in Romans chapter 6. He'll get to some of that in Romans chapter 12. And the point is this. Are there commands to obey and good works to do in the Christian life? Yes, there absolutely are. But before we even get there, God wants us to know who we are so that we will become what we are and what he created us to be. And that's where we're going this morning. Know who you are. Let's jump right into it. The first thing I want you to see this morning is the inconceivable. The inconceivable. The big question that Paul asks right here. He says in verse one, what shall we say then? Everybody read this out loud with me, the rest of that verse. Okay, ready? Here we go. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Man, this question makes perfect sense. Paul just got done teaching an incredible truth. Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. That's at the end of chapter five, and that is a phenomenal truth. Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. In our brokenness, in our sinful nature thinking, you know what we do? Well, then that sounds good. Let's sin away because God's gonna forgive. Who we are in Christ The fact that he forgives many offenses makes the teaching of justification by grace dangerously clear. Dangerously clear. Paul never is going to correct his statement. Where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. And God's grace has enabled many to come to conclusions like this one poet did. He said, I like committing crimes. God likes forgiving them. Really, this world is admirably arranged. Now, let's be honest for a minute before we move on. How many of you have had that type of similar thinking at one point or another in your life? How many of you have ever been headed down a road and you know deep down inside that it's wrong, but you're like, well, you know what? If I do it anyway, God's going to forgive me. Because we understand grace so well, we also come up with really great statements like this. It's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. 
I think this is an understanding of, of the benefits that come along with God's grace. I had the opportunity of going to a wonderful Christian college. The Christian college that I went to had some good rules, some pretty strict rules. Back in the day when I was there, it's gotten a whole lot better now. But anyway, back in the day. And you would get demerits if you broke the rules. Well, I found out that it was not until you got to about 75 demerits that you would start getting in serious trouble. So the way I looked at it is that's 75 bucks of cash I got to spend on good opportunities and fun times. You know, make sure you spend it wisely. That's kind of the thinking that's here where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. Does God want us to think this way when it comes to our relationship with him? Look what he says in verse two. Everybody out loud, those words together, out loud. What's he say? God forbid. God forbid that we think this way. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It's inconceivable. It is inconceivable to even think that God saved you from sin so that you could continue in sin. It's how in the world could you continue or even want to continue in the life that had you condemned, that had you broken, that had you desperately looking for hope? That's what Paul's saying. This is, this is a ridiculous way to think, to presume upon God's grace in that way. He didn't save us so that we could continue in sin. He saved us so he could set us free from sin. Here's a practical application right off the bat. I got saved. The day that I put my faith and trust in Jesus and what he did for me on the cross, I got saved. That's wonderful terminology that we as Christians use. Often you'll hear that. You'll talk about the day that you got saved. Or you might ask somebody, when did you get saved? Or we might even share with somebody that we're not sure. Hey, has there ever been a time in your life where you've been saved? Do you understand why we use that terminology? Because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. It was just like we were out in the middle of the ocean without any life preserver. And in given time, we're gonna sink and we're gonna die. But then Jesus came along and he rescued us. He saved us from our sin. He saved us from the condemnation of our sin. He literally set us free. Never get over the fact that you got saved. Are you saved? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? How can we who are dead in sin continue to live in there? We've been rescued right off the bat. This is where he's going. This is what he's talking about. Don't return to something that condemned you, destroyed you, and ruined you. Get delivered from that. So that's the inconceivable, that we would continue in sin. I think it's even more inconceivable that we would be saved based on everything that we know about who we are. Secondly, though, not only are we going to look at the inconceivable, we're going to look at the believable. Look at verses 3 and 4. It says in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, Paul's setting up his argument here, and he's using baptism. And Paul is literally talking about water baptism here, okay? He's talking about um, baptism by immersion. That's why I have this shirt on today. You may be wondering why I'm wearing this. I have decided, several people said, are we baptizing today? I didn't know about this. I, there was some panic that ran through some of our staff. There's no water in that baptistry. The musicians didn't know about it, and I'm walking around, and I'm wearing this shirt. And the reason why, and I'm going to come back to it more in a little bit, is because Paul's using baptism as an illustration here. He's using baptism to talk about the conversion experience as a whole. Baptism, what is it? It is a visible, dramatic picture. I want to get that in there. It's a visible, dramatic picture of the invisible reality that took place when we believed in Jesus and when we were born again. So he's really using a visible picture to drive home the invisible reality that happened the very moment that we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In baptism, you have two main points. Every single time I baptize somebody on Sunday morning, I say, buried in the likeness of his death. And you go down. That's what baptism is. It's a picture of his death, his burial, being fully immersed under the water. And then what's the second part of baptism? It says, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. That's the two points. That's what verses four and five talked about. 
When you're baptized, you are buried in the likeness of his death. You are raised in the likeness of his resurrection in a very real sense. When he died, when Jesus died, we died with him. And when he rose again, we rose again with him. And that's why the end of verse four says, even so also we should walk in newness of life. Now verse five just reiterates all of this. Okay, look what it says. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Does everybody understand what we're talking about? Just like he died, we died. Just like he rose again, we rose again. Now, how many of you would like a little bit of a further explanation on what he's really talking about and what he's trying to drive home here? Well, I'm glad that you do. Whether you want it or not, it's coming. All right. So here's the two things I want you to see. One is this. I am dead to sin. We're talking about know who you are, the believable. I am dead to sin. Look at verse six. Knowing this, that our old man is, what's that next word? Everybody out loud together. I, the old man is crucified with him. My old man was crucified. Who I was died with Christ on the cross. Now you might be sitting here thinking, and you're, you're, you're a smart person, and you might be thinking, Pastor Mike, how in the world could that be true? Obviously, I'm still alive here today, right? Obviously, nothing visibly dramatic happened the moment that I believed. I'm still alive. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a legal death, a legal transaction. The punishment for sin was death, and on the cross, what did Jesus do? He died. This was a unique one-time event, and it is unrepeatable. Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross to pay for our sins once and for all. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it is a one-time event. It is unique, and it is unrepeatable. When you, the moment you believe, you get all of the Holy Spirit there is to get. You get all of the justification that there is to get. It is a legal transaction that takes place once and for all by putting our faith and trust in what Jesus Christ did once and for all on the cross. So we're headed somewhere here. But now let's not miss this point. He still says, but my old man was crucified. I don't know about you, but I have a sin nature. Anybody else in here have a sin nature? Anybody else have a monster inside of you that you've got to rein in? I have a sin nature. My sin nature is just not a little ugly part of me that I don't like. It's not just like this little compartment of my life that I don't like and I keep it locked and chained. It's not that case. My sin nature is me. I am dead in my trespasses and sins. I am born broken. I am born a mess. I am born in desperate need of a help. I'm born in desperate need of a savior. That's who I am. My sin nature was my life. No matter how hard I try, I can never escape it. But when Jesus Christ died and when I put my faith and trust in him, my old man was crucified. Now the verse goes on to say some more. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. In that death that Jesus died, the body of sin was destroyed. It no longer has power over any of us. That's why we are more than conquerors. That's why our victory in Christ is so decisive and so complete that nothing can ever rob us from it. The power of sin was absolutely destroyed. Destroyed does not mean annihilated. It means to render inactive, to make of no effect. Obviously, we still live in a world that's full of sin, right? But when his death on the cross, he rendered sin inactive. He made it of no effect. In the death that I died with Christ on the cross, my sinful nature was defeated. My sinful nature was um, disabled. And my sinful nature was deprived of its power. How many of you does that sound pretty good? When Jesus died and I put my faith and trust in him, my old man was crucified, that my sin nature, that, the, that sin would be rendered inactive, that the body of sin might be destroyed. And in that death, I died with Christ on the cross. That, pow, that sin no longer has power in my life. And look how he concludes in verses six, at the end of verse six and in verse seven. He says that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Everybody read verse seven with me out loud. It says, for he that is dead is freed from sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. 
That word freed, it's a beautiful word. It's actually the same word as justified in the Greek language. That word freed means to be declared righteous. When we died with Christ, we weren't just set free from the penalty of sin. We were set free from the guilt, the shame, the power, the filthiness of sin and everything that's evil and disgusting about it. And now our righteousness is no longer seen as filthy rags to God, but we have the very righteousness of Jesus Christ and everything about our lives changed. The whole point of what Paul is driving home here is I have not been freed from, uh, sorry, the whole point that he's trying to drive home here is this. I have been freed from sin, not freed to sin. Do you understand the difference? I am dead to my sin. I have been set free from my sin, which doesn't now enable me to go right back to the very thing that left me in need of a savior. I'm set free from it. It no longer has power on my life. Now, the only way that verse seven makes sense is with part two of the same story, which is this. I am alive to God. I'm not only dead to my sin, I'm also alive to God. Look at verses eight through 10. It says, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. The beauty of these verses that we're talking about right now is they aren't talking about the future life that we're going to have with Christ. And by the way, that future life is glorious. Man, I would love when we were singing, oh, praise the name. There's going to be that day, the breaking dawn. He's going to return. And what an awesome day that that's going to be. And that's going to be a glorious day. And I'm not trying to diminish that. But these verses are not talking about that glorious future day. They are talking about today. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Let's go back to baptism for a second. I'm going to go back here. I got to make this point. I'm coming, I promise. That took a little longer than I thought. All right. Ooh, there is water in here and that is not good. That's going to be fun. <laughs> All right, so when you, <laughs> I'm trying not to get my feet wet. So here's what I want you to understand about baptism. Baptism is a funeral. It's something new that I'd never had thought about before. But baptism in a very real sense is a funeral. Buried in the likeness of his death. The moment you got saved and the moment you believed, your old man died. Something absolutely dramatic and huge took place in your life. You are no longer who you were. You become a brand new creation in Christ. So buried in the likeness of his death, man, it's a funeral, but it's not a sad funeral because it's unlike any funeral that any of us have ever experienced at any time in our life. Because as quick as we die, guess what happens? We come back to life buried in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection, even so walk in the newness of life. And that's why I have this shirt on right here today. Because I have decided. Okay, there we go. I don't want to squeak the rest of the time. I'll try to stand still. I was not anticipating the power of that moment being <laughs> robbed like that. All right, so do we all understand? It's a funeral, but it's a resurrection at the same time. And at the end of it, even so walk in the newness of life because our God is alive and he is a living savior. And so we get to the last point of what we're talking about. Know who you are, the doable, the doable. I have decided, listen, verse 11 is the key to everything that we're talking about this morning. It's the practical application. Look what it says. Likewise, reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember back at the beginning of this message, we're talking about the power of our minds. We're talking about knowing who you are so that you can become who you are. And he says, likewise, Based on everything that you've heard so, so far, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. That word reckon, it is an accounting term. 
It's like going to the bank and checking your balance. And when you look at the balance of your bank account, there is $1 billion sitting in that bank account. Now, reckon means this, to deem or consider something to be true. So if I go to my bank account and there's a billion dollars in there, that's going to be a miracle by God. (laughs) But if I go to my bank account and I check it and I see $1 billion in there, I'm going to reckon, I'm going to deem or consider it to be true. And then you know what I'm going to do? It's more than just acknowledging that with your head. It's living like it's a reality. If I got a billion dollars in my bank account, I'm going to act like a billionaire. I'm going to buy a mansion, some nice cars, and a yacht, and a few other things, and I'm going to get my wife a really awesome birthday present this week because I'm going to live like that's a reality. You know what God's telling us to do? Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead unto sin and alive unto God. Do you understand this morning that God desperately wants you, and you're not wanted dead or alive. You're wanted dead and alive. You understand what we're talking about? I am dead to sin. I am dead to my past. And I am now alive unto Christ. And I'm going to walk in the newness of life. And I'm going to look into the bank account of God's word. And I'm going to look at the cross and what Jesus Christ did. And I'm going to look at the evidence of his goodness that's all over my life. And I'm going to make a decision that I'm going to live like this is a new reality every single day of my life. Do you understand why this is so much better and so much deeper? than just a list of rules and a list of good works to do. Because if we reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God, we're naturally going to pick up this book and we're going to run to God's word. We're naturally going to be hungry for a relationship with him. We're naturally going to want to be obedient to what he says we're going to do. And so we better park here and understand the gigantic reality that took place the moment that we believed in Jesus as our Savior. And so to reckon is all about, I have decided. What's the doable? So we're going to look at the the bank account and we're going to realize I'm dead and I'm alive. So now what? What? Well, I've decided to rebel. I've decided to rebel. Look at verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Based on the fact that I am dead and I am alive, I will not let sin have the power and control in my life. Here's another another undeniable reality. Even though sin and death has been rendered inactive and it's powerless in our lives, it still has a lot of power if we give it its power, right? It doesn't mean that I'm not prone to sin. It doesn't mean that my heart still does not crave things that are not good for me. It doesn't mean that I still don't have struggles and I still don't have a desire to cave into the lust of my flesh and to do things that I know are not right and are not wrong. And what I have to come to the conclusion is because I am dead and because I am alive, I'm going to rebel against everything about my past and against everything that's not going to be pleasing to God. And I'm going to stand up and walk in the newness of life that he's called me to walk in here's a question are you dead to sin are you truly dead to sin when you got saved you may not have realized the dramatic exchange that was taking place you you knew you were a sinner you knew that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins but you may not have realized that something huge is happening like my my old man is dying And I'm becoming a new creation in Christ and the Holy Spirit's gonna enable me and give me power to live my life in a different way. And you may not have understood that at the moment of salvation, but you're here today and you're hearing the truth of God's word and you're seeing it for yourself. And the question that I have for you is this, are you dead? Have you gotten to the point in your life where you said, I don't want anything to do with my past. I don't want anything to do with sin. I don't want anything to do with what's going to hurt and destroy me in my life. I want everything to do with who God is. And I'm going to rebel against that. And I'm going to walk away from it. How many of you in here got saved under 10 years of age? Go ahead and slip your hand up if that's you. That's the majority of people in here. Here's what I know to be true. If you got saved in your 20s, 30s, 40s, I have zero doubt in my mind that you want nothing to do with your past life because you know wholeheartedly what drew you to Christ. But sometimes when you grow up in a Christian home, we don't take, we don't fully appreciate 
that exchange that happened in our lives. Because what does a five-year-old get saved from? Throwing some temper tantrums to his mom and dad? Listen, here's, here's what I want you to understand. We get saved from the same sin that any adult gets saved from. And it's just a dramatic exchange that takes place in our lives. How many of you that got saved under 10 years of age had another point in your life where you got saved again or you got assurance of your salvation and you made sure that you knew for sure you were saved beyond a shadow of a doubt? How many of you had that experience? Man, Alana and I talk to people like that all the time. We both had a similar experience to that in my life. And here's the conclusion that I've come to. Only you and God truly know if you've been saved. And I do believe that salvation is being born again. And there's a, a time and a place where you truly repent of your sins. It's not like you just all of a sudden know and you're saved. No, there has to be a belief and a repentance in Jesus. And only you and God know if that happened and took place. But here's what I believe with all my heart. As you get older and as you start growing up, you start becoming aware of the fact that I'm a sinner. And I don't always obey my parents. And I don't always do things that I like to do. And I've got some, some really difficult pulls to the things of this world. And you know what we have to do? Sometimes the Lord makes us start questioning whether or not we're truly saved. Not to make us doubt, but to help us to take that next step forward. That I am going to rebel against sin. I'm not going to let it reign in my body any longer. I am a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. And it's a part of our sanctification. And it's a part of our growth. So have you nailed that past life? Have you nailed it to the cross? And for those of you that have been shielded and have been, had the privilege of growing up in a Christian home, in a Christian environment, look around at people who choose their own way and you will see the truth of God's word playing out every day over and over again. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. There are consequences to sin. There is baggage that comes with sin. Rebel against it. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and then alive unto God. And that's what verse 13 is all about. Look what it says. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. I have decided to rebel and I have decided to yield. And just like before I was saved, my members, my physical, mortal body, everything about me, my eyes, my ears, my hands, my feet, my mouth, my tongue, everything about me was dead in its trespasses and sins. Therefore, it wasn't used to glorify God. It was used to glorify myself. And when we reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, we now offer and we yield our bodies as living sacrifices unto God and everything that goes with it. Now my eyes and my ears and my hands and my feet and my mouth and my tongue and every single thing about me is being offered to God. It's a deliberate decisive choice in my life that no longer am I dead to sin, but I'm alive unto God. How do you get to 50 years of service on a mission field in Australia? How do you get to be in your 70s and you're still not done and you still got that fight left in you and God's gonna call you back to leave the comforts of everything that you could enjoy retired. Nobody would even question. Nobody would even doubt it. Man, you could go live around your children and your grandchildren, but that's not what God's called us to do. And not that that's wrong necessarily. But what he's called us to do is to yield ourselves to God. He died on a cross. He gave his life. Everything about us has changed. How can we just continue in sin? How can we be complacent? How can we be apathetic when there is a newness of life, when there is the power of God that is available to us in every single day and with every fiber of our being? Take everything about your life and yield it to God and offer it to him and say, you know what, I'm gonna rebel against my past, but I'm gonna wholeheartedly offer myself to you. And whatever you want, wherever you're gonna lead, that's where I'm gonna go. This is where it all starts. It's not about being at church today. It's not about how much you serve. You can be doing all of those things and you can be so far off base from where you're truly supposed to be. Are you dead? 
And are you thankful that God saved you and delivered you from everything that your past was and everything that you could be, but by the grace of God? But are you alive? And are you walking in that newness of life? Have you decided? Have you reckoned? Have you looked into the bank account of God's word and said, that's who I am, that's how I'm gonna live, that's what my life is gonna be every day. I am dead and I am alive and I'm gonna walk that way.